Thank you all for coming. Um, I would, uh, you're going to be working for this. Um, so I'm going to put you to work the very first thing with a little preview activity here. This is about abstract algebra. So uh, on your paper there, create the addition and multiplication tables for Z6. That's just the equivalence classes of um, these equivalence classes with arithmetic modulo 6. And when you finish, of course, compare with your neighbor. Make sure you didn't make any stupid arithmetic errors. Um, and while you're working on those, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. So keep on working, and I'm going to be talking at you while you're working. So, All right. First of all, if you were here last year and you talked to me, you know I was very upset because I had what I thought was a failed abstract algebra class. It was the first time I had taught abstract algebra. Okay, and that is ever. And there's only one class I technically failed in graduate school, and that was abstract algebra. Okay, let me give you a little caveat there. It had been 15 years since I'd had a math class, and my undergraduate degree was not in math. So when I went back to graduate school, that first algebra class was a little of a challenge. But I wanted to teach this class. The teacher who had been teaching it um, was the only one that the students at this school had known for at least 20 years. I believe it was 26, but I wouldn't swear to that. And um, let's just say he left unexpectedly. And it was nobody was set up to teach it. So that first year, 2013, I used Margaret Morrow's notes that are pu published in Giblam. And I thought they were great. You know, I was working through them. I thought they were wonderful. Unfortunately, three weeks into the class, I discovered that the students go, but we've never had to write a proof before. And they had all but one been through our intro to proofs class. Um, needless to say, that sort of blew my mind as to what I was supposed to do with them. But I hung in there and I scaffolded work with them. I did everything. But they were essentially against me from that point on when they realized that, that I was expecting them to actually do proofs. And they were feeling like, well, nobody's ever shown us how to do them. Well, we worked on it. A couple of students really liked the class. There were 14 students, I believe, in that class. So um, I had never seen abstract algebra taught in any way except the standard uh, definition theorem proof. Um, when I took it, OK, this is another reason I failed it. It started with category theory. My first introduction with category theory. So, um, but I had been successful with other IBL type stuff. I have been using David Henderson. I'd gone to a seminar with him and had been teaching geometry, college geometry, extremely successfully um, in a IBL format for about 15 years. Uh, and the students loved the geometry class. So it just hurt me so bad that they hated this abstract algebra class. I've even taught non-Euclidean geometry. Um, I came here the very first time before I taught it to the, more, the conference here, got notes from Tom Ingram, and ran it twice very successfully. Um, and then I ran it as an independent study. Maybe not quite so well, but that was more with the students. And I've come here several times wanting and understanding and knowing what I needed to do. Although I've discovered that, of course, in my case, if I don't see how people are doing it, I have a hard time actually getting, implementing in my own class what should be there. So, all right, I'm sure you finished. Have you compared? Compared your, your, your things? Okay. Now, well, as you compare, think about how is Z6 similar or different from the integers? What are some of the properties that the integers have that Z6 doesn't? or vice versa, okay? And now, of course, if this were a standard class, I would have you share them and, and go out, but you can make your set of lists. I'm assuming you're going to be pretty good at that, but that'll give you something to think about. Um, and you're gonna observe that Z6 is a uh, theme throughout this for no reason other than that I just like Z6, so, okay. Now, what kind of students do we have? 
Northwest Missouri State, where I'm from, is a moderately selective regional comprehensive university with about 7,000 students, about 6,500 of those are undergraduates. Most of the students in abstract algebra are um, secondary math pre-service teachers. Probably 80 or 90% of them are. Um, I did have one this semester who was a, a, a secondary math education minor as opposed to a major. She was a history major. Um, and very rarely do we have pure math majors in there. Uh, typically, the classes run 10, 12 students, somewhere around in there. It's only offered once per year, and we only have a one semester sequence of this course. So, what did I want? Um, I wanted the students to have lots of examples to play with. And a lot of this came from, in this past fall, I read uh, the book by David Tall, How Humans Learn to Think Mathematically. And that really had a strong influence on what I was thinking. He talks about uh, progressing up from examples up through to, to abstraction. And that was what I wanted to get to. I wanted to experiment with a rings first approach. OK, I had category theory. It was on groups. I had about this much rings out of this much material. Even in my graduate course, I only had about that much rings and fields. So I really didn't have a good feel for them. So I was teaching this class so I could learn it. OK, that's what I like. And I thought that um, some type of active learning, IBL, whatever, was an absolute must. So all right, now, maybe a, a ring you haven't thought about but create the addition and multiplication tables for two z6. So these are just the equivalence classes of 0, 2, and 4, still with addition and multiplication modulo 6. And then if you're really wanting some more stuff to do, create the multiplication tables for the direct sum z2, uh, direct sum z3. That's the ordered pairs where the first element's in z1, the second element's in, uh, z, first element's in z2, the second element's in z3. You add and multiply coordinate-wise within those, group, within those uh, rings. So give you some more stuff to play with while you're thinking about that. OK? So a little bit more about Northwest. Northwest is a textbook rental school. The book that had been used by this teacher was Hurstein, third edition. It was probably at least 15 years old. Um, so I'm going, there's no way. I didn't use it the first year in 2013. Um, Students got it, but I didn't use it. Um, but I started ordering books this year, and I ordered lots and lots and lots of books. I sent a query to some of the Project Next lists. In fact, um, some of the people in this room responded to me on some of those queries that I sent. And one of the uh, books I was pointing to was actually a set of notes at the time was uh, by Jonathan Hodge, Steve uh, Slicker, Slicker, I never can say that name, and Ted Sundstrom. And this is what was really strange. OK, I'm done with the semester. I go on to Amazon to see how long till I can order the book. I can't order it for the school because it's way past our deadline. The day I go on is the day that it is published. OK, I looked it up. It was December 9th. So, so this is the book, OK? And I think there's another copy of it over here, too. Yeah. So. Um, I ordered it, I liked it, it seemed like it was exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, of course, I had not seen it taught, I got this in December, I'm teaching this in January, I did not have a lot of time to prepare, so I did it, several things wrong. So, okay, back to your groups, your rings. What do you observe about 2Z6 compared to Z6? Okay, and I've listed some things you might think about here. Um, is 2Z6 a subring of Z6? By the subring test? And then you'd have the subring test in front of you, and you could go look at it and see did it satisfy that condition? Does Z6 have a multiplicative identity? Does 2Z6 have a multiplicative identity? That's weird. Is 2z6 a field? As a matter of fact, it is. Is z6 a field? Not even close.
close. Okay, so with these examples, then I get the students, then there's a whole list of questions. So they're looking at how subfields are related to, or subrings are related to their rings, and there's a whole bunch of things. So they've got a whole bunch of examples here that they can look at and test their conjectures with. And, and then they can take those examples that they've got and use them to help them create their proofs. Now, I wasn't really good at getting this done because of uh, some of my issues with the class. But, um, so this is sort of how the chapters start off in this book. They're, in, they're called investigations. You start with some preview activities. That'd be like creating those, those tables. Uh, maybe looking at a couple of easy questions about them, things that they could do without too much thought. And then there's reading and, and activities for them to do. They should do these before they come to class. And then we would discuss and present the, uh, the activities in class. They could get up and present them on the board. I would sometimes have three or four groups get up and we would, we would uh, do like a gallery version of a, who's, whose version of this is the best. What do you like about it? What are good things? What are bad things? Um, and then there were concluding activities, frequently that sort of led you to what might be coming up in maybe the next uh, investigation or so. And after that, there was homework. Some of the really hard proofs are scaffolded. Some of them, uh, you'll have activities that'll give you all the parts of the proof. And then at the very end, the next activity is now do the proof. So there, were, there was quite a bit of that scaffolding, which I thought was a big help for these students that were still struggling. Now, they, most of them now had had a proofs class, intro to proofs class, where they did write proofs. Okay, because that got changed after I kind of threw a hissy fit the year before, so. Um, what happened? The students went to the board. They were active, they were excited. Working in groups, they loved it because they had hands-on concrete things for them to work on. And then I would have to force them up to the abstract level as they were getting them to the proofs. But it was amazing, every day a light bulb went off for at least one student. And for me, the most amazing thing was that about half of the students in the class this past semester are also tutors in our developmental math course. And they go, hmm, commutative, we just talked about that. Associative, we just talked about that. Division of polynomials, we just talked about that. I said, yeah, you see how everything in that developmental class you're doing here in this abstract algebra class. So I think for them tying it back as secondary, as going into secondary ed, they were able to see more of an application of abstract algebra to what they were actually doing. About midway through though, I discovered that I was giving too much homework. Um, when it took me five pages to write up a homework key in tiny print, I knew it was too much. Um, and so I did cut back on the homework. And as soon as I cut back on the homework, they were back and engaged in doing what I was doing. So um, there is a trade-off between how much you give as homework and how much that you have them actually do in class. And I went a little overboard on the homework. I'm a homework Nazi. That's one of my nicknames. So, All right. Now. Does 2Z6 look like any familiar ring or field? If it does, can you find, is it like enough to be, is there an isomorphic? So can you find an isomorphism? Okay. This was actually on their final exam. This was one of the questions on their final exam. I'm not saying they all got it, but it was one of the questions there. Um, but I think it was great for them to have these examples that they carried with them through. By the time we were to investigation six, they have uh, the integers, the rational numbers, the real numbers, the complex numbers, uh, the mat matrices, n by n matrices. They have the even numbers as a ring without a unit, uh, just a ring. Um, they have uh, on power sets, there's stuff with that. They have Zn and Zp. They have matrices over these different things. So they have a huge number of examples that are all very familiar and very easy to work with. And I think that was a big change and that was something I really wanted to work on. Things I still need to work on and if you all have suggestions, this would be wonderfully helpful. I need to pare down homework. One of the things I like to do is I like them to do homework and then I like them to be able to revisit their homework after I've given comments on it. I think that's extremely important. And they didn't have time to do that this year. So I need to, to get that and maybe create that into a portfolio. 
and obviously I need to cut down on what, uh, there was some stuff sort of in the middle of what we did, there was some number theory stuff. I don't need to do as much of that to get them to where I need them to be. I barely got to groups this year. Um, and I would like to get at least two weeks in groups instead of just two or three days in groups. We only have 14 weeks in our trimester, our semester, so ours is a little bit shorter than other people. So um, it was a challenge. But here's what I thought was the best thing. This was, I do not know who put this up. This appeared on a whiteboard that is outside my office door that last week of class. Okay, which is a very different attitude than they had the year before when a student stood up in the middle of the final and challenged me on one of the problems I had assigned on the final. So, so I know I did something right this time. The moral, do not give up on active teaching or IBL methods. Okay, we know their, their work. I think the research is even coming out now that, that in all situations, if you can have some type of active learning, it is going to be um, a better learning environment for your students than lecture. So, um, so don't give up on it. Find out what works for you. Uh, it most likely will not be exactly like anybody else's approach. Um, keep coming to these conferences, so getting ideas. And this is, sounds really strange. I think I had more fun than the students did this semester. Now, they had fun, but I come into class, they go, I go, you guys don't know what we're going to do today. This is just so exciting. Isn't that really cool? And they look at me like, they'd, you know, roll their eyes at me, but that was it. So, anyway, thank you.